This is where I think this gets even more fun. David Wells, one of our malware analysts out of our anti-fraud lab in Seattle, is going to talk about what he does all day, and that's deconstruct malware. And as Greg was alluding to, keeping his ear on the ground of what hackers, fraudsters, uh, and other fun people do all day. So David, go ahead. All right, how's the volume? Can you hear me? All right, great. Uh, one, I want to start with a fun fact real quick. So Greg just talked about botnet rentals. And uh, I, I happen to run a cybersecurity group in Seattle, and one of the questions I ask them is, how much do you think it costs to rent a botnet? And I get the response of, oh, that's probably $2,000 or so. And then uh, uh, I say, okay, how much do you think it would cost to purchase 1,000 bots on the black market? And they say, oh, this is, this is some real-time stuff. This is 20, 20K, 10K. You know what the answer is? $20 to rent 1,000 bots on the black market and only 70 to purchase 1,000 bots to do whatever you want with. So you can see a very uh, high ROI setup there. And this is double checked through various sources. The Russians uh, charge about this much, the Americans do. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of a, not very uh, something you would expect. So my name is David Wells, and I want to share with you some of the cool research we've been doing in the IAS Fraud Lab, uh, mainly our malware analysis. So as Greg talked about, oh, a large amount of app fraud is conducted through botnets and malware. So understanding these attack vectors greatly helps us uh, fight against app fraud. Now, having a cybersecurity background, when I say analyze malware, I mean fully taking the malware apart to the point where you know everything about the malware and there's nothing that you don't know. And this is, this is the top level that you see cybersecurity firms shoot for and antivirus labs, and this is what we do. And we find uh, some really interesting things by doing that. So I just want to show you. So this involves a skill called reverse engineering. It's taking apart malware like this. And what is reverse engineering? It's pretty self-explanatory. We, we do it all the time. We try to figure out components, how they work, and to take things apart. Uh, with software, the intricacies look a little bit different. What you see here on the left, this is what you'll see malware developers write in. This is called C. It's a programmer language. And this is short, concise, and legible to developers. And on the right, you'll see what reverse engineers see. And this difference is because, well, when the developers want to actually, or the malware authors even, want to build a, a executable payload to execute on your machine, it goes through what's called a compiler. And what that does is converts it all to machine code language. If you ever heard the term assembly language or x86, that's what this is. So it turns it into what's on the right. So if you open up an exe or one of these malware files, it'll, it'll look like gibberish, like that on the right. So the reverse engineering art is the fact of trying to take what's on the right there and make sense to where, to where you can understand it. It's a very uh, specialized skill that, that we've uh, worked on. Uh, and with that, I want to take you in the week of a IAS malware analyst and specifically our research on Powellikes. So Powellikes was a notorious botnet, infected about uh, 200,000 machines, mainly in the US, because they want that IP address for, for the ad fraud. This was built solely for ad fraud, by the way, too. This was not a generic bot. And it defrauded an estimated $300,000 a day. This is some very serious, serious money that, they're, that they were able to make with this. Uh, so taking you through it, we started in 2015, we heard rumors of a botnet. Uh, and the part that really caught our attention was that this botnet was designed solely for ad fraud. So we're well connected in the cybersecurity news, news feeds and all that. So, so with this, we want to, now we need, this attracts our attention. We got to figure out what this is. We got to look more into it. And that involves obtaining the sample. And so I have a saying about malware is that the people who don't want it find it and the people who want it can't find it. And this is uh, set up very, they're very careful about this. But luckily, we have a presence in the virus community as well. So not only the black hat community, but also uh, some of the white hats. And this right here is a form of some brilliant researchers all around the world. It's called kernelmode.info. And they'll share and collaborate on various malware and threats going on in the world. So right here, uh, this helps us because right there, we have a guy offering a fresh power like sample that he caught for just, collab just giving it up for free for researchers to look at. So this is perfect. Now we have our sample. Now it's time to execute Powellex. This is what happens. This is what a victim sees when they execute Powellex. Nothing. That's what good ad fraud malware does. You don't know you're infected. 
But using special tools, though, we can see some suspicious activity. And I want to say, that what we're seeing here is a list of all processes running. This, though, doesn't even look suspicious to a lot of people. I think this would, this would pass a lot of IT professionals, too. Uh, you'll see that every, uh, every application here is signed by Microsoft. These are all, you can actually find those on the file system. They're all real, real processes. There's nothing really strange going on. But to a malware analyst, I can see that these processes shouldn't be running in an idle environment. So something, something a little bit strange is going on. On the other note, we can see all windows that are open. Right here, we see a bunch of Internet Explorer windows, but there's, there's no Internet Explorer running. We don't, we don't see that anywhere. So these, this is because they're in a hidden state. Okay. So what we have now, we, have, we know there's an infected machine. It's doing something very strange. And this is the part where we want to reverse engineer it. What I'm going to show you now is I'm opening up the malware and looking inside of it to figure out what, what it's all doing. Right here, oh, this looks familiar. This is a list of processes that I saw running that, were, that probably shouldn't be running in an idle environment. So we know Powerlax has a hand in this. Now, what is it doing with these processes? It's using a time-tested technique from the 90s called process injection. And what process injection is, is if you start a process, a valid process on your machine, let's say Notepad or MS Paint, and what they'll do is inject bad code into it and resume it. And you can see these, this process that you're very familiar with running, but you don't know that it's doing something completely different. And this is unfortunately still uh, possible to do on Windows machines. What is it injecting? It's injecting a web browser. So we know it's wanting to control something with the web browser. And with that web browser, it's producing tremendous traffic. This right here is a traffic capture of all network requests leaving that infected machine. This is done 24-7, day, night, no break. That's how you make $300,000 a day. I put down 200,000 machines, do some uh, very big uh, damage to uh, advertisers there. This is the fun part, getting the Powerlax human interaction. So visiting a web page, that's only half the battle. They need to emulate a human on that page to actually create a convincing impression and make the money they want. And we'll start with the mouse simulation. What you see here, this is a regular human's mouse. This is, this is taken uh, uh, of somebody viewing a news site. And you'll see it's very organic, broken up, uh, very, very human-like, right? It's a heat map. This is what Powell-like's mouse looks like. It's a little bit scattered. And this is because we reverse engineered this algorithm. All they did was they take a random X coordinate and a random Y coordinate on the screen and send the mouse directly there. And the way to send the mouse doesn't affect the human's mouse. You can still use a mouse on the affected computer because they're doing mouse spoofing at a different level. So it's also very stealthy to the infected person. Uh, the scrolling behavior we see all it does is what it's doing when we find out that it's doing a random decision. It's computing a random decision. If it passes that random yes, no, then it will scroll down. Then it computes another random decision. And if that's a yes, then it will scroll up. So what we have now, we have random mouse movement and random scrolling. And that combination can create countless permutations when you visit a website, looking like truly a different visitor every time. So Powerlax also recognized the value in playing videos that it lands on to create extra ad revenue there. Now Powerlax could not only play videos, but it was smart about how it did it. What you see here is Powerlax did this pre-check before it plays a video. It ensured that the video is at least 350 by 250 pixels large. Only then would Powerlax actually try to play that video and monetize off it. If it's too small, like what we see there, it won't even bother playing it. And kind of, this was kind of odd seeing this at first, but we figured out what they were doing. The reason they do this is they're trying to avoid a trap. They don't want a fake small video player there for Powlex to trip on and accidentally click play, and then we can detect that and know it's a bot. So you can think of this as a, yet another measure. It's going about looking like a human, only playing visible and large enough videos. Powlex also was a, a clicker, so it click, click links on the page. And this had some additional logic that we thought was also very interesting. This is, this is kind of gives you a little bit of a, a mind inside the bot developer and what, where they're at right now. So what they would do with the links is they would do a three, three things. They'd gather, compare, and click. So first what they do, when they land on a page, they'll gather all links on that page. 
then what they'll do is compare. So they'll take the link, the domain of that link, compare it with the current web page they're on, and if that matches, then they'll know it's an internal link, and if it doesn't, they know it's an external link. Okay, so now they compare them, they put these into two different groups, and then they do a random decision to click a random link. However, it's not uniformly random. They put much more probability on clicking an internal link than an external link. And that's because when you send a pal like traffic to a visitor, you don't want the bot to immediately click an external link and leave that page because that deprives in view time for the people buying your traffic. So what they did was they tried to opt more towards clicking an internal link to navigate to another page on that, that visitor. Uh, however, they don't want to look like they're doing the same thing all the time, so they do occasionally click an external link. And Powell likes fraudulent traffic here really revealed the business model of ad fraud that I'm going to go over here. What we saw is Powell likes wouldn't visit a website directly. What it would do instead is visit a bunch of sites that would redirect it. So what you see here is Powell likes would visit this site on the left, be instantly redirected, instantly redirected, and instantly redirected finally to a page with ads where it moved the mouse and, and do human activity. And this kind of clashes with our misconception of bot traffic. So especially when I first entered the ad fraud botnet world, I expected bots to look something like this. They get instruction from the CNC server, they just visit a website directly that paid them and they, they make money. But it's not, it's not like that. In fact, no business is really like that. You never have the manufacturer dealing directly with the customer. And with ad, fraudulent traffic, it's no different. So it looks more like this. We have the bot, rather than visiting directly uh, one of those websites, it visits what's known as a top traffic seller. And this top traffic seller can say it acts like a large distributor. And its job is to redirect that impression to a buyer below. And with a buyer below, they resell that. So they're like maybe Costco in this example. They resell that down to like a, a mom and pop shop down here. And so the website, the only thing they know is dealing with the person that they bought traffic directly above from. So there is no clear connection between a purchaser of, of traffic and the, uh, and the actual bot. So what can we do with that information? I see this traffic going out on my computer to these, these fraudulent sellers of traffic because uh, this, is the, this is the redirect process. So with that, we can trace it right back to a fraudster and talk to them. And that's what I'll show you here. Right here is a conversation I have with one of these people selling Powellex traffic. And so I'm showing you right in the middle of our conversation here. What, I, what I'm starting with, I'll read it to you. It's not, I say, not pop under iframe. Do you have anything other than that? And what I'm trying to do is steer the conversation towards bots. Because anybody can offer traffic through pop-ups and iframes, but I don't want that. I want to know more about their, their bot traffic. And they say, we don't work with pop under iframes at all. OK, so this is uh, very sketchy. Uh, okay, sounds good. Okay, I just added money to your balance. As you have two offers, you should see traffic soon. And this next sentence here really sums up the knowledge. Also, we do have traffic that works great with video. You can test it any time. Okay, so how do you know that unless you actually have a hand in this botnet? Uh, and one thing I'll add here is that dealing with traffic sellers, they never talk about bots. You, 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 you're going to have a hard time getting to talk about that because it suits no purpose for them. They would rather live in plausible deniability. So th you really don't know who you're dealing with when you buy traffic. Even when you purposely try to talk about bots, they just direct the conversation elsewhere. So what do we know now? We know traffic sellers evolve with power likes. We know what power likes looks like as an impression. And we know the capabilities and techniques of bot developers which is really cool. Now we can actually see how, how advanced are, are they really? What, how, what tactics are they doing in depth to defraud pages and defraud advertisers? And in closing, I want to bring up uh, a fraud visibility breadth versus depth approach and how a combination of both is very helpful. With existing ad tech, we're very well uh, set up for breadth visibility. We have these server-side fraud monitoring tools that are listening, processing billions of impressions all around the world, different geos, tapping into different botnets, different types of users, and this creates an immense breadth visibility. So they, they can see into various botnets that nobody even knows about, and this is great. But one thing that this doesn't provide is depth visibility. 
So even though they might be looking at knowing a botnet traffic's hitting their, uh, uh, causing an impression, they don't really know much about that botnet. They don't know the inner workings of it. They don't know the traffic sellers involved. They don't, there's a few unknowns there. So attacking the problem from the other end with malware analysis, we can get depth visibility. And now, with this combination, it's a very healthy relationship of communication. So I can get new intel from our fraud monitoring. If there's a botnet over here I need to check out, I check it out, provide them the details of what's really all going on and making better connections. Um, and this is, this is the approach that, that our fraud lab's been doing with, with fraudulent traffic. So in closing, I, aside from educating you of what, how these bots actually work in the, in the, uh, under the hood, I, I want to leave with a message. So we see that bots, they do the mouse movement, they can do scrolling, they do video playing, they're, they're very convincing. And because of that, the message I want to leave is don't take all traffic at face value. Thank you.